Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, adventurers, travelers, investors, entrepreneurs, and simply mind bogglers. To find all episodes of this show, simply go to Spotify, iTunes, or YouTube, or go to our website, judgmentcallpodcast.com. If you like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or subscribe to us on YouTube. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the airfare deals that you really want. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% in the airfare. Those include $150 round-trip tickets to Hawaii for many cities in the US, or $600 life led tickets in business class from the US to Asia, or $100 business class life led tickets from Africa round trip all the way to Asia. In case you didn't know, about half the world is open for business again and accepts travelers. Most of those countries are in South America, Africa and Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP or if that's too many letters for you, simply go to MTP, the number four, and the letter u.com to sign up for your 30 day free trial. Robert, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate that. I know you're very busy. Oh, you're welcome. So let's see. Yeah. Um, so I was really mesmerized um, when I read your book, um, The Case for Space. Um, that's your most recent book. Yes. And you're a true visionary. You outlined basically in that book not just what we could do tomorrow, or what we could do in the next 20 years, but you go out two, 300, maybe 400 years on how we can make space our new home. And I've never seen something that was not just in a science fiction way, a lot of science fiction writers have done that, but also in, in you go into the details, you go into the math, you go into how we can actually engineer this. When did you, your your love for space and your love for Mars, when did that get started? When was the original moment where you felt like, that's where I want to be? Well, um, it was Sputnik, 1957, October. Um, I was five when Sputnik flew. And um, while to the adults it may have been uh, terrifying, uh, to me, it was exhilarating uh, because I was already reading science fiction. And what Sputnik said to me was that this space traveling future was going to be real. And I wanted to be part of it and just take it from there. Uh, Sputnik is the first you know, world event that I can actually remember in terms of my personal experience. And uh, it sticks with me now. Back into the 1990s, when I read this right, correct me if it's wrong, you proposed one of the first missions to Mars at the time for George W. Bush, right? A space program that NASA would potentially had. Well, it wasn't uh, by any means the first proposal for a human mission to Mars. Uh, von Braun had proposed a human mission to Mars, uh, well, in German, is the late 40s in English in the, in the 50s. Uh, and NASA had developed a, a plan for a mission to Mars under von Braun's guidance in the 60s. And uh, NASA also uh, in the 1980s um, developed a plan for a human mission to Mars. But the difference between my plan and the NASA plan which uh, of the 80s, which I was very well acquainted with, is that that was huge and impossibly costly and complex as were the previous von Braun plans. Whereas the difference was with Mars Direct, it wasn't the first Mars mission plan, it was the first practical Mars mission plan. And uh, in which we eliminated all on-orbit assembly, all on-orbit infrastructure, all orbit rendezvous, in fact, all advanced propulsion, um, just a whole bunch of nonsense uh, and went straight for the throat. And that, that was the difference with Mars Direct. Um, yeah. Mars Direct took this thing out of science fiction and, and 
said, look, if you want to do it, you can do it. Here's how you can do it. Do you want to do it? Yeah. The, the pr original proposal, I don't know if this was in dollars at the time or uh, today's dollars, was just about $400 billion, right? Yeah, it was that's correct. Expensive. It was $400 billion in uh, late 1980s money. Yeah. Okay. That seems very doable. NASA, what, the, well, was that? No, it wasn't doable. Yeah. <laughs> that was too much. That was, yeah. uh, okay. Now, of course, this year, you know, we're expropriating two trillion for this and two trillion for that. But in those days, $400 billion was real money. And uh, the, um, and it basically killed uh, the first President Bush's space exploration initiative. It's Congress took one look at that price and said goodbye. Uh, yeah. And in fact, it was because that price was too much, that that was a program killing price, that the management at Martin Marietta, where I was working at that time, which ordinarily would not want to disagree with the customer, NASA, was willing to say, look, we've got a better plan. You can do this for $40 billion, okay, wow. which is something that would be uh, doable. and. So that was the difference. The 90-day the, the report, which was the NASA plan of record, um, yeah, $400 billion, 30 years, people said, forget it. We came along and said we could do this in 30 to $40 billion in less than 10 years. And people said, okay, we're listening. Um, and, and that was the difference between Mars Direct and, and the 90-day report. And, of course, the yeah. key was uh, to make maximum use of Martian resources, travel light, live off the land. That's how people have explored successfully on Earth. You know, that is how Amundsen did the Northwest Passage. When previous to him, gigantic British Navy expeditions involving fleets of warships failed um, because he made use of the resources available in the Arctic. Okay. You know, we brought dogs, dog sleds, which could be fed off the caribou, which could be hunted if you had dog sleds. Um, you know, and, 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 and that was the thing, we, as opposed to bringing, you know, a, a hundred tons of salt pork, uh, and China to eat it on. I mean, the, the, you know, which is the difference. Yeah, I could certainly see that pioneering and entrepreneurial approach shines through the book. And, you know, you just mentioned that to live off the land and use the resources you've got. Mm -hmm. When did you ever run out of patience with NASA? Because they they never really went for the plan, right? In the end, at well, least so far. Uh, certainly, a faction in NASA went for the plan, and it influenced NASA's thinking about Mars. They made in situ resources uh, a priority technology to develop, but the problem was um, best NASA plan, which was done under the influence of Mars Direct, was what they called Design Reference Mission 3, where they attempted, where they took the basic principles of Mars Direct, which was direct launch to Mars, no on-orbit assembly, long duration stays on Mars starting from the first mission, use of in-situ resources starting from the first mission, and they actually came up with their own version of Mars Direct. I call it Mars Semi-Direct. And instead of my $30 billion, their estimate was $55 billion. They also had a larger crew, a larger ship, more people, more equipment, more of everything. But, you know, and I objected to some of this stuff. But actually what Carl Sagan said to me at the time was, look, Bob, it doesn't matter whether it's $50 billion or $30 billion. What matters is it's $50 billion, not $500 billion. Um, because that's the key distinction. So that was the best plan. Now, they could have disciplined that. They could have gotten it less. Um, but in fact, where they went from that is that then started elaborating it because the way it works at NASA is you say, well, we want to plan to go to Mars. And all these people show up with technologies that they'd like to have included. And they said, basically say, we'll support you if you include us in your mission. And so the mission tends to balloon to include more and more different technologies in order to make everyone happy. And which yes. is exactly the opposite of the correct way to do engineering. The correct way to do engineering is to make the fewest possible people happy by buying their stuff. Okay, yeah. the, um, by making the mission as lean as possible 
instead of making it as big as possible in order to make sure everyone has a good time. Um, okay. Yeah. So, you know, you basically have entropy. Did you ever go to the Russians? Did you ever pitch it to the Russians if they would finance it? No. I mean, I, I certainly have spoken about the plan in Russia. And, um, you know, my earlier book, The Case for Mars, has been published in Russian. Um, and, um, and in fact, just this week was, is something that, you know, it was the 60th anniversary of the Gagarin flight. And a Russian author published a, a, a review of the 10 best books about space exploration and they included the Russian version of the case for Mars. Um, but, but no, I certainly haven't proposed it to the Russian government. How did you, how did your relationship with Elon Musk start? Um, he seems to be a very converted disciple of yours now, and he is very bullish on, on Mars exploration. How did that happen? Were you guys always talking about that for a long time or is that a relatively recent thing? It dates back to 2001. Um, well, first of all, the case for Mars was published in 96. And some point between then and, and 2001, Musk read it uh, and it influenced him. And then in 2001, the Mars Society um, held a fundraiser in the Bay Area. And um, it was $500 a plate. And somebody sends in this check for $5,000. And we look at this, Who, who's this? Who's sending in $5,000 for a $500 plate dinner? And it's somebody named Elon Musk, never heard of him. So we researched him and we found out who he was. He was the head of PayPal, which we had heard of. And so I made it my business to have like a two hour cup of coffee with him before the dinner. And so we talked a lot. And, um, and then he came here to my company afterwards and he gave $100,000, which helped us build our Mars Desert Research Station. Um, and he joined our board. Um, and he was on our board for a while. But then he said to me, look, you know, I'm not the kind of person that wants to be part of someone else's deal. I need to lead my own initiative. Um, so, you know, and, and he said, look, you know, I've already made all the money I could ever spend. So I'm... It, oh, sorry. No problem. Um, uh, so I... Uh, he wanted and to so he said, he said, look, I'm wondering what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Because uh, here he is, he's like, 30 years old and um, he's already made his, you know, first several hundred million. And the, um, and he says, well, it's, it's either going to be Mars or solar energy. These are the two most important things that I can think of. And I argued for Mars. I said, look, solar energy, it, you know, the business plan is obvious. If anyone can come up with a technology that will make it competitive against fossil fuels, it'll happen. And it doesn't require uh, a unique visionary for that. In other words, if the technology is there, the money will be there. Um, but Mars is going to take someone who, you know, can think way outside the box and isn't just doing it for the money. Uh, and in the end, he decided to do both and the car company too. Um, but he did Mars and he did SpaceX. Uh, and that, that's how that, that went. Um, um. But the Starship that SpaceX has now developed, and I learned that from your book, the biggest challenge that we face is basically the, how much we can, for, in terms of mass, kilogram or tons, we can bring to space for what cost. And the Starship that we now have, that SpaceX has, is that good enough and viable enough to go to Mars? Well, sure. If, if, if Musk can develop Starship as it is currently described, that will be an excellent technology for enabling not only uh, exploration of Mars, but the settlement of Mars. Uh, yeah. I mean, Starship is a fully reusable launch vehicle with a capability about equal to the Saturn V moon rocket, 
but with uh, the prospect of about 1% the launch cost because it's reusable instead of expendable. And furthermore, it runs on methane oxygen propellant, which is what we can make on Mars. So you can fly to Mars and you can refuel it there and fly it back. So it is a very strong uh, 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 proposal for enabling uh, human Mars exploration. Now, there are some alternative architectures one could think of. You could fly the Starship all the way to Mars by refueling it in Earth orbit, as Musk discusses, and then refuel the whole big Starship on Mars and fly it back. Or you could make a smaller Starship that you put inside the big Starship, lift that to orbit, fly to Mars in that, Okay, and that means the thing you, you're you delivering less to Mars with each flight, but you don't have to refuel the Starship on Earth orbit, and the thing you have to fly back in requires much less propellant. Those are two alternative concepts, and there are others that one could think of. But, ba but the basic approach it would certainly be uh, revolutionary and enabling. Yeah. For that first couple of missions, is there a way to bring enough fuel to Mars so we don't have to actually set up a base and generate fuel there, which seems no, like a lot of challenges? No, no, no. The, the Starship uses the Mars direct approach, which is to go direct to the surface and refuel there to fly back. If, if you uh, try to bring the propellant to fly back, the whole plan falls apart. Um, right. That is, is disabling. Uh, that's why the 90-day report was... $400 billion instead of $40 billion, um, and, uh, and not particularly capable either. Uh, if you want to go direct to the Martian surface and direct return, you want to make your return propellant there. But that is what you should do. I mean, no one has explored on Earth successfully bringing with them all their supplies. Not really. You know, imagine if Lewis and Clark, you know, the explorers who first crossed the American continent to try to bring with them all the food, water, and air for themselves and their horses. They, they would have needed a, a wagon train of supplies for every man and every horse. And then, of course, each of the wagon drivers and the wagon horses would have needed another wagon train. And it, yeah. it would have just gone exponential. And, but instead, they hunted their way across. And that's yeah. what you have to do. So when we go to Mars, this first ship, and I think you describe it in detail uh, in the book, we we would set up this first Mars mission, and I think there's a couple of ways that you describe how to do that, in in order to to land and then produce the fuel. What is your gut feeling? How risky that is? So it might not work out. There might we might have to start a rescue mission, um, but well, it no, might have the same in, problem. In the Mars direct mission, we send the Earth return vehicle in advance of the crew, and we make the propellant before the crew has ever left Earth. So there is no risk to the crew at oh, all. Okay. The crew propellant's already been made. Now, in the Starship architecture, uh, if you fly the Starship to Mars and then make the propellant and to fly back, then you have some risk. However, one could easily alter that architecture to say, first, we fly a Starship to Mars with no one in it and have it make its propellant. And then we fly to Mars with a Starship with the crew and the crew comes back in the first one. So That's you always a crucial have detail a probably that I missed. Uh, starship uh, on Mars before you ever leave Earth. So, so with it's a, fully a automated, right? So the first planning, mission to generate the propellant is fully risk. automated. What? Uh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off. I'm just curious. The, the first mission would be fully automated to, to generate a propellant ready for us on Mars. Well, yes, automated, although you could teleoperate robots and so forth. Sure. But, but, yes. When... When you, um, and I know you looked at different architectures that you also describe in the book, there is something, and I spoke to George Dyson about that, about his father's idea, or he was a co-conspirator on that idea of the Orion spaceship that was nuclear powered. And I think you also at some point had a ship that was called the Mayflower. Are these still things that are in the back of your mind and we might build them one day or you discarded these concepts for now? Well, the Orion concept, um, which was proposed in the late 50s, uh, basically using atomic explosives to propel a spacecraft. And obviously that's an extremely potent way to drive a spacecraft. Um, but um, it was more or less made impossible by the test ban treaty. And I, I don't think 
uh, you really want to be sending spaceships to orbit with, you know, a thousand atomic bombs in them. I think some people might get upset about that. Uh, the, the, um, but uh, there's other ways to do nuclear propulsion uh, that not as dramatic, but don't involve bombs. Uh, and I think that uh, nuclear propulsion is, we're going to eventually use it. Uh, I, we do not need it to, for human Mars missions. Uh, I think once Mars, we start to settle Mars, there'll probably be uh, nuclear powered spaceships that will fly back and forth between Mars and Earth much faster than we can do now. But, you know, Columbus sailed the Atlantic in ships that even 50 years later, no one would sail the Atlantic in. It's when Europeans became transatlantic in nature that you started developing more advanced ships. So you went from Columbus's ships to three-mastered caravels to clipper ships to steamboats, ocean liners, and Boeing 747s. So, you know, um, you know, most Americans like me have um, ancestors, grandparents, parents who were immigrants. Uh, and, you know, and when they came, well, for instance, mine in, in the early 1900s, you know, they didn't fly in nice airliners. They came in the bilge of reeking you know, cargo ships, and, you know, and it took a month and, you know, they're down there in steerage and they're eating the garbage peels thrown down to them by the first class passengers. And, 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 and you hear these stories of what it took to come to America. And of course, that was easy compared to people 100 years before them. Okay, but today, of course, when we fly across the Atlantic, you know, you do it in six hours and, you know, you know, maybe you read a book and, and then you're there. And, um, the, you know, so it's similarly, I think that, you know, the grandchildren of the first Mars colonists will listen to the stories of their grandparents um, with the same way. Wow, it took you six months to fly and you're cooped up in this little thing and, and, and you know, and, and, and so forth. And you can only take a shower once every four days. And, but, the, 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 you know, because they will be doing it in two weeks in a fusion powered spaceship, um, you know, equipped with hot tubs and pool tables. And the, 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 the you know, because it'll change, but, but that's what's going to make it change. Yeah, that's an excellent way to explain it. I, I love it. <laughs> And I was watching the TV show, The Expanse on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And I, they must have read your book a while ago because they, they show exactly that. So there's a secondary colony of, of Earth on, on Mars and it's slightly different, but they're terraforming it and they are going about making it a habitable place, but they still feel there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues they have with Earth's population and that struggle. When we go to Mars, um, how soon do you feel we could have a permanent base there that's realistic with the technology we have today and slight improvements or small well, improvements to that? I think if Starship is successful, we'll have our first explorers on Mars in 10 years okay. and we'll have uh, a real Mars base in 20. Wow. Um, and probably in 30, you'll have the first children being born on Mars, the first schools on Mars. Um, you know, that kind of thing. You'll start to have the, the beginning of the first, not just base, but village on Mars. That's so exciting to think about. When you, when you look at this project right now, what do you feel is the biggest obstacle? Obviously, there's political will and the, it, it's about money. But what is like a technical issue that you've seen that is really the toughest right now? Well, okay. Um, must be said, Musk is, is taking this thing on head on. Um, you know, he's building a, a new starship every month. He's launching them and crashing them and figuring out what went wrong and then sending up the next one. Uh, so this is a very aggressive program, uh, very different from NASA programs where they take 10 years or more before they try launching it. Um, and um, there's any number of technical problems in making this thing work. Um, but if you take this, if you're willing to do this kind of a frontal attack, um, I, I think he's going to succeed. I, I think the biggest chance, I mean, there's things that could go wrong. What if when one of these starship crashes, it crashes on people? 
then it won't just be, oh, well, there's some more invested metal. Then, then Musk is in trouble. Or what if Musk gets himself into trouble through some other thing? Because as you know, he's a real risk taker uh, in business and, and, and politics and, and so forth. He skates very close to the edge of the ice. So he could fail. But, you know, I think that even if Musk fails at this point, the net effect will only be to set us back about 10 years because he's already set the model. He's already proven that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things uh, and one-third the time at one-tenth the cost than it, major government kind of contractors can do it and even do things they had deemed impossible altogether. And, you know, he's not the only rich person in the world. And whoever opens up the space frontier will be immortal. Okay. Yeah. And yep. that, you know, and that is nothing more valuable than that. And I mean, I happen to know right now also, there's at least five companies in China that have gotten funding that are attempting to create reusable launch vehicles. You know, there's also the Blue Origin organization. There, there's others. Um, he has, 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 has shown it can be done. So even if he personally should fail, in a sense, he will have succeeded because he has 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 thrown the door open. Yeah, well, we we all hope he succeeds and SpaceX mm -hmm. succeeds. Do you think? And you just mentioned China that we will have a geopolitical struggle once we go to Mars. We have like a Chinese section, a Russian section, and an American section. Well, you know, uh, of course, in the new world here, there were. Um, British, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch colonies. Uh, none of those countries have substantial holdings here now, although there are substantial populations that speak all of those, except for Dutch, uh, languages. Um, um, you know, North America, we have English and French, and then Spanish and, and Portuguese in South and Central America. Uh, I don't think the countries that launch these colonies will hold them, but they will uh, establish the point of departure for the cultures of those colonies. Yes. So, um, I mean, the Mars is going to be owned by the Martians, the people who go there. And um, the Uh, but yeah, whoever participates will have a chance to have their culture included in the future. Uh, you know, it's like uh, if you want to have descendants in the future, you got to have children. <laughs> um, and uh, if you don't, then you won't. Um, and, and that's what it boils down to. That answers a lot of <laughs> current politics, that mm -hmm. statement. Um, I'm, I'm with you. I'm fully with you. When we, a lot of people, when they think of space, and I think this was, you know, Musk was quipping about that when he started to get into this business. It's always, there used to be no business model, right? So irrespective of it costs $3 billion, $30 billion, or $300 billion, it seems to be, you couldn't make money or enough money from it. And then there came asteroid mining as, a, as an idea, but it hasn't, uh, it's obviously something they haven't done yet. What would be the business model for going to the moon and to the Mars uh, long-term? Well, here, here's the thing. Um, people do not live to make money. People make money in order to live, okay? Yeah. You know, in Finland or somewhere, there are people who live by hunting reindeer. Now, they're not doing that because they did a business plan and they figured that that would be the most profitable form of enterprise they could have. They had a certain way of life and they figured out a way in which they could support it financially. Okay, so um, the, 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 now, I believe, you know, people 
are not going to go to Mars to make money. They're going to go to Mars in order to have a place where they can make their own world, write their own rules. And then they will figure out how to make enough money to support that. And how that will be, I believe, will actually be by exporting technology, inventions, patents, intellectual property. Because you see, the Martians will be a group of technologically adept people in a frontier environment that's going to force them to innovate, to meet some terrific challenges. And if those innovations that allow them to survive on Mars will also represent profitable technologies that can be licensed on Earth. I can give you several examples. Um, the Martians are going to have an extreme labor shortage. Uh, so just as we had in Frontier America, actually, which is, was the great driver for the development of labor-saving machinery in 19th century America. And Americans became very famous for creating gadgets to save time. Okay. Um, and, well, the Martians are going to have a much more extreme uh, shortage, and they're going to have to do, yes, labor-saving machinery, automation, robotics, artificial intelligence. All these things are... are, are are the 21st century equivalent of labor-saving machinery. And, and I think the Martians will push them to a much higher degree than is, is sought on Earth. And these innovations will be licensable here. I think the Martians will push genetic modification of organisms to create ultra-productive crops in a way that people don't uh, see the necessity for on Earth because we have all this land. Well, they're gonna be growing crops in greenhouses. They're gonna have to produce a lot more in a lot less land. Uh, I think the Martians will develop fusion power. You know, okay, there's some people interested in fusion power on Earth, but, you know, it's a very much a sideline because on Earth there's so many other ways. You can just burn fuels and you can make all the energy you want from fossil fuels that have been stored here for billions of years. And there's waterfalls and there's wind and there's tides and there's, you know, solar energy two and a half times as powerful as it is on Mars. And, you know, the, 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 there's all these other things you can do. And at the end of the day, a kilowatt's a kilowatt. And so I said, what do I need fusion power for? I'll just burn oil, okay, or coal or something. Okay, well, there's no coal or oil or natural gas on Mars. And while you could make methane on Mars, it takes energy to do it. So it's just really a way of storing energy. It's not a source of energy. Uh, the wind is too thin. Solar energy is too weak. Uh, yeah, you could probably make fission reactors, but fission reactors require um, a very large industrial base for processing the you know, uranium ore and into useful fission fuel. And, but Mars has got six times the deuterium as Earth. And Mars is going to be constantly electrolyzing water as part of the life support system, which means you're going to be able to make heavy water uh, in quantity. And um, the uh, so they will have a driver to create fusion power. So they'll make that to meet their own needs. But that represents a terrific technology for export to Earth. And it also, by the way, represents uh, a, a technology that will give us uh, initial capability for interstellar travel. Yeah. So in that sense, Mars is the bridge to the stars. Uh, I, I read that in your book, and I think this is this is fascinating. We know from the 18th, 19th century, yes, a lot of people escaped prosecution when they went to the U.S., but it was also the draw of the free land, right? It is a resource that you got for, you didn't really know if it was worthwhile or it was some terrible piece of land that you would get, but it's something that was considered was the capital of the time. It was a bit of land that you could use any way you wanted. It was freedom, but it was also the chance to make money potentially. And then, you know, we saw the gold rush and all these things. They fuel these these dreams of people, the entrepreneurial dreams or just greedy dreams, whatever it right, is. I think if, that's... If you understand it, mm -hmm. when you say there's free land, what you're really saying is there's a shortage of people. Um, yeah, the, but the land was a resource that could make money, it would produce well, something, right? Actually, work. yeah, but 
first of all, most people that came here, and some certainly went out to the frontier directly and farmed, but others got work in uh, industry uh, and or making railroads. Or, and guess what? The pay was higher here than in Europe, a lot higher, uh, because there's a labor shortage. Um, and uh, so a, a labor shortage is a tremendous draw. If you're a worker, you want there to be a labor shortage. Um, okay, and um, it puts a premium on labor, and therefore it puts a premium on multiplying the productivity of labor because the labor costs so much. Okay, so it actually becomes a driver for progress, technological, and as well as social progress. Because if you want people to come to your country, you want it to be the kind of country that people want to come to. Okay, uh, so you give people more rights than they have in their homelands. So it's not, it's more pay, it's more dignity, it's more rights, it's more opportunities. It's all that. So it's not just the land. Yeah, now I know why you titled that spaceship idea from you a while ago that I mentioned earlier, the Mayflower. It's, now I see the connection. This. I, I'm sure we will have tens of thousands of volunteers for this new country, for that mission to Mars eventually over the years. When, when they get there, when I assume for a lot of, as you described earlier, it will be a one-way mission. Yes, they could return, but obviously they, they probably don't have that thought when, they, when well, they go out in the first place. A colonist is doing a one-way mission. That's yeah. what a colonist yeah. is. That's the difference between a colonist and an explorer. Yeah. First explorers, I believe, will be round trip, but colonists, by definition, are going one way. Is radiation that we see on Mars is something we can solve? Are you worried about that? Not that much. Um, the radiation dose on the surface of Mars is the same as that on the space station. And um, that is to say, it's half of the dose in interplanetary space, a little less than half. Um, and but that's if you're out on the surface. If you build your colonies so that most of the living areas are underground or dug into the side of cliffs or whatever, then you're only experiencing that radiation dose, not all the time as the people on the space station are, but only when you're going outside. Uh, and, you know, all the health effects that we've experienced in space have not been from radiation. None have been from radiation. They've all been from zero gravity. Yep. Okay. So um, th there, there is, is not uh, evidence that this amount of radiation is, is harmful. Um, the, now, zero gravity is harmful. On Mars, we have one-third gravity. And it remains to be seen what the health effects of that will be. Um, I believe that there'll be much less than zero gravity, not only because you have some gravity and therefore some exercise when you move around, which you don't have in zero gravity, but also one of the problems of zero gravity is that the bodily fluids go to the wrong parts of the body. The head becomes fat and, all, and setting off all kinds of crazy endocrine signals and the, the we're not adapted for that. Whereas I once asked Buzz Aldrin, who's been in Earth, zero gravity, and on the moon, when he was on the moon in one six gravity, did that feel more like zero gravity or Earth gravity? And he said he felt like he was on Earth. Yeah. Because even in one six gravity, the fluids go to the right place. When, and you outlined this in your book, when we first get to Mars, we need a spacesuit to go outside, right? So there's yes. a pressure problem and there's obviously the problem of no oxygen and not enough oxygen in the atmosphere. You, you describe in the book that something with technology we can already, in theory, put together, we can at least pressurize Mars, even if we can't provide enough oxygen. So you still need to bring your, your oxygen, but you don't have the pressure of your spacesuit anymore. How long will that take? Well, okay, so yeah, 
there's two phases of, of, of terraforming Mars. You might say the first phase is changing it physically and the second change is changing it chemically. And the first phase is much easier to do than the second. Okay, because if we can warm Mars, which we can do with greenhouse gases, the, we can, if you warmed Mars, the Mars atmosphere would become much thicker because a lot of carbon dioxide that's soaked into the soil will come out. It will thicken Mars's atmosphere a lot. Okay, thicken it yeah. from being 1% as much Earth pressure as maybe 30%. Um, that, by the way, will solve your radiation problem on the surface right there, um, yeah. having that much atmosphere above you. Uh, that could be done within, I believe, 50 years of when the greenhousing process starts. So, you know, the way I see it, you know, okay, first humans land on Mars, 10 years from now, first children born on Mars, uh, 30 years from now, um, you know, by the end of the century, there's, you know, cities on Mars, okay? Uh, millions of people with significant industrial capabilities, they could begin the terraforming process. Um, and then within 50 years of that, you could have Mars have a thick atmosphere. Now, that atmosphere, as you said, would not be breathable. But you wouldn't wear need a spacesuit anymore. You only need an oxygen mask. Um, and also that Mars would be much warmer. There would be liquid water on its surface. Um, you could the rivers would be flowing again. You'd have rain. You could start to spread plants around. Now, if you just do the math and you assume we cover the planet pretty much with plants, we help them out, uh, chemical fertilizers and other things to help them. Um, it would still take a thousand years for plants as we know them to put enough oxygen in Mars's atmosphere for people. But if we're looking now in, you know, 150 years from now, it's really not that much of a stretch to imagine that we will have genetic engineering that can produce plants whose photosynthesis is not 1% efficient, which is what our current plants are, but five or ten percent efficient. In which case, the time scale of doing this could be much faster. Yeah, I was hoping it's something that we could see in our lifetimes, and I say lifetimes because I'd already gray on David Sinclair has said too that aging is more or less solved. That the tech is almost there to solve it's 15, 20 years, and then we can live not forever, but hundreds of years instead of well, if we do, years. then it'll be in our lifetime. But if not we'll see the beginnings of it. Yeah. I know there's been a bunch of experiments being done to simulate life on Mars or even maybe this terraforming in a certain, in a certain desert area. What are the, the biggest challenges we've learned from this? There must be psychological challenges, obviously, in the early stages, but then also later on, maybe there's well, technological the issues where we found has established yeah. analog Mars stations where we do practice Mars missions in the desert and in the Arctic, and some other people have started doing that too. Uh, and there we're addressing the human factors challenges associated with exploration, which by the way, if you have a good crew, the main human factors challenge is, is, is not boredom, it's overwork. Uh, you want to choose a good crew. You want to choose the kind of crew you would want to go on any kind of expedition with. People who can work together, aren't trying to knife each other, aren't trying to outshine each other, who are, are, are good friends, um, one for all and all for one, uh, and who have a sense of humor so that when things go wrong, they don't get all grouchy, and but can just take it in stride. Um, if you have that kind of thing, then you'll have a good crew on Mars, and then morale will hold up. Um, in terms of terraforming, really, or building a society on Mars, the challenge is, is the same as building a society anywhere. How do we create uh, a vibrant, optimistic, healthy, civic culture? You know, the Mars Society held a contest last year to design a one million person Mars city state. And in fact, we are going to publish the 20 best designs uh, in a book probably before the end of April. We're almost ready to publish. Uh, 
but people designed not only the technologies, but the economies and the social systems, and the architecture, all trying to address this. And there are a lot of different ideas, actually. Um, the political ideas ranged from social democratic to libertarian. Um, the, 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 and I think there'll actually be a lot of different Mars colonies based on different kinds of ideas. And some will succeed and some will fail. But that's how we'll find out the ones that do work, by trying it. Yeah, I find this so exciting. I was debating this with, with Stephen Smith, and we, we talked about his views on political philosophy. He said, well, that's kind of the first um, lesson and the first lesson that I run my students through is they come up with a, with a design of a state, of a regime, of a state, a political regime from scratch. And then we'll talk about it, and then we go back to the real world, and then it gets really complicated to transfer that system into the real world. But we haven't seen... Um, this from scratch design of a new political regime in quite some time, you know, what America was to the old world in Europe, we, we, we didn't see a lot of this, I don't want to call it a revolution that has kind of a bad name, but we start from scratch with a better system that, you know, is well, put into place by an election. Well, we tried, I mean, the founders of this country called it a noble experiment. Yeah. Uh, they took the ideas of 18th century liberalism which were certainly known in Europe, they had been created in Europe, but they couldn't be implemented in Europe. There were previously existing power structures that wouldn't accept them and, and, and which viewed them as ridiculous. Um, the, the, but here we tried it out and while it wasn't perfect, it worked well enough that millions of people came here. Uh, the country grew, became in fact the most powerful country in the world and a model for the rest of the world. Uh, and to some extent, the standard of government of the people, by the people, for the people, is the standard. And uh, that you measure the degree of civilization of a country of now. Yeah. Yeah, John Locke would love that <laughs> if, he, if he could hear, if he could hear the success of his ideas. Mm. A lot of people say when we when we go through all this trouble and make Mars habitable and we, we, we would have to work with that environment that's still somewhat uncertain, why don't we go all the way and basically build our own bases, kind of what we did with the space station, control the environment instead of going to a planet, why don't we set up these mini planets of space stations? Well, it, I believe it, it's easier to mm -hmm. settle a planet than to build one. Um, you know, if you're talking about a Mars mission, you know, a starship, it's 100 tons, and if you did it Musk's way, you refuel it with another 500 tons of propellant and you go to Mars. Um, and if you sent a thousand of them to Mars, you know, you'd have a million tons total delivered to Mars, but you've got a planet and a million people there. To build an O'Neill colony in Earth orbit, you'd have to transport billions of tons uh, to create a tiny little colony. Uh, no, it's much easier to settle a planet than to build one. Yeah. Do you think the space elevator is something we see relatively quickly, which kind of would take care of that problem, right? Going to low orbit with very, very low cost. Well, I don't know about relatively quickly. We could build space elevators for the moon with technology that is now available. From moon to Earth? What? Because from, it has from, less gravity. From the moon? Or in no, in other words, if you moon. wanted to go from the lunar surface into space and you yeah. wanted a space elevator for that, we could build that. Yeah. Um, for Mars, it's not quite. Uh, although you could build a kind of a partial space elevator that would make it a lot easier to get to orbit on to Mars. And I discussed that in the case for space, building a yeah. space elevator coming down from Phobos. But the um, Earth... No, we would need to have some revolutionary materials. Now, if we do develop those revolutionary materials, then that will become possible, yes. The, the, the materials you, you just mentioned, this is the, the internal cohesion of that, that cable, so to speak, that's the problem? Yes, it's the strength to weight of the materials. Yeah. Okay, but I, I, I would say the following. Uh, if someone was to discuss this issue 
Well, say in 1960, when it was first invented by Artisano, Soviet engineer, the strongest materials known at that time would have been steel cable. And we now have materials like spectra that have strength to weight um, uh, strength to weight uh, uh, almost a hundred times more than steel. Now, if we could do that again, then yes, you could have um, space elevators. I'm going to have to go soon. Um, sure. All right. Well, you two more questions question I, I, I have for you. Would that be okay? What? Two more questions I have for you. Oh, yeah, please. They'll be easy. First one, when we go to Mars, first couple of missions, would you sign up? Would you personally want to go? If I had a chance, yes. What can we do to help? What can we do to spread the make word? Sure, spread the word. Make sure we it need works. More Elon Musk's. Okay, <laughs> okay. that's how we're going to do this. Nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. If the idea is allowed to recruit to its banners the forces needed for its victory, and I mean Musk is an example of that. He is someone who came to this because he was recruited by the idea. So spread the idea. We'll get more Musks. And sooner or later, one of them will succeed. We'll work on that. Robert, thanks so much for your time. That was fantastic. Thanks for sharing right, your It was incredible. Okay. All right. Well, we'll talk soon. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.